Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Discussing a Murderer. This is Jeff Jones, and with me today is a smaller panel than usual, but nonetheless extremely powerful. Um, and that is the panel with uh, Kelly and, and Jack. Uh, Jack filling in for Dr. Silkman, and uh, Big Jeff, unfortunately, won't be making it uh, today. He's taking a sick day. Um, and you know, everybody deserves that when they get sick. So um, let's introduce the panel starting at the top. Kelly, how's it going? Good morning, everyone. I'm doing very well. Uh, just a shout out to uh, Je Big Jeff and Dr. Silkman. I wish you both are a speedy recovery. I uh, hope you guys are feeling better. Uh, and welcome everyone to, I think we're on, what is it, episode 20 now? Yeah, they're just all blending together now, aren't they, Kelly? Yeah. So, yeah, thanks yeah. for uh, continuing to support us, and let's get the show going. Absolutely. And, Jack, welcome back. Uh, thanks again for last week. It's your second week in a row with us, and maybe uh, extending your stay uh, a little longer. We have to hear, we'll have to know week by week with Dr. Silkman. But, again, thanks for uh, coming and filling in today, Jack. Really appreciate the invite and glad to be here and uh, to join Kelly Sentiment, um, Speedy Recovery, to Doc and Big Jeff. And I'd like to add Jess Ron to that list because I know she's under the weather. And so, yeah, hope all these folks can get well. That's right. We're sending our vitamin C vibes out. That's for sure. Um, so where we left off last week was talking about the the wrap-up of Stephen's case. Uh, he was found guilty of the murder, not found guilty of the dismemberment charge, and found guilty of the possession of a, of a felony, of a felon with the possession of a weapon. Um, and so the next portion, we're going to move into uh, uh, a little bit more geared towards the, the Brendan side of this case and how this was a separate court case. So uh, without any further ado... Let's get to the documentary. The way it turned out, they got their way. Period. Mackaw County won again. could just uh, uh, imagine that Big Jeff would have stopped the podcast for this moment and been like, is this another man miracle? Is this another coincidence? Like, you know, Papa Avery just in fact summed it entirely up. They got what they wanted. Like, what an absolute fuckery of a case that, you know, you've got another conviction, another wrongful conviction. The depositions got washed away. The, the law enforcement become the heroes just how seriously it's it when you hear that again and again you just are reminded how lucky can they have gotten the timeline like the timeline was so on point for them it's out of this world I, and I just wanted to bring that up because I know that everyone in the community just it's that timeline that just makes you go what the fuck went wrong and how did it go wrong for Stephen so quickly all over again? I agree uh, there, Kelly. I, I, so much of this has been timing. And, and uh, I think you really summed up the comments. There's not a lot that I can, that I can add to that. Then otherwise we'd just be in an echo chamber. But um, I agree with those sentiments. I, wa I just wanted to talk about what's on screen right now because we don't really talk about this place at all but i mean this house is right here on the corner was this house destroyed was this uh, house yeah yes after that, 
pretty sure that's a spring tubes house and it was just it was leveled those are the spring tubes residents okay. spring, sp- right. yeah yes yeah spring spring tubes i, I said that wrong yeah. that's correct no, that's okay. and and uh, it, was there someone living there at the time do you know i, I think they had vacated I'm, I'm not exactly sure if the house got condemned or what right. the circumstance I mean, was the reason I ask is that it, you know, it would be a potential spot to be like, "Hey, there's an abandoned house here. We can do the hustle shot there, and no one will bother us." You know what I mean? It's just one of those one-off things that just happened to cross my mind. It's, it's neither here nor there. Calf, calf's done a lot of research on the spring tubes. I believe that there was two, though. There was these spring tubes, and then there was another set of spring tubes down the road. Um, That's right. And she found that I believe. I shouldn't really say it because I listened to her and it soaks in, but I don't want to speak on her behalf in case I do get it wrong. But one of these spring tubes had a connection, I believe, to Bradley Checks, that he knew them. So there's that little connection there with, um, obviously, we all know who Bradley Checks is. So, again, whether that means anything, I don't know. Like, it's just that, there's always a connection and CAF has done a lot of research on these, this family. So it's quite interesting when she um, gets going because you, you just find these little snippets of um, just nuggets of information, I guess. Absolutely. Sergeant Andrew Colburn, one of the law enforcement officers accused of planting evidence, released a statement today. It reads in part, I hope and pray that this verdict helps put to rest any suspicions or loss of confidence that this community may have felt towards our department. Because I assure everyone that this agency has some of the finest law enforcement officers in the country in its employ, end quote. Because he's making this statement in the real time. So he's blaming making a murderer for, uh, and potentially trying to civil sue them for portraying him as this monster um, after the fact in a documentary but in the real time he's having to make a statement that has nothing to do with making a murder because in reality that was what was part of the defense team and they have every legal right to build that case in defense against him because that was their their strategy and they have every legal right to do that so the fact I'm trying to make is the fact he's going in and having to make this statement in the real time doesn't reflect on making a murderer and then being responsible for the image he now has. That's bullshit because his image was already damaged in 2005 because of Andy Colburn. I completely agree with what Kel said that this statement was in real time has nothing to do with the filmmakers making a murderer nothing this is what was going on in the community at the time and he was part of that civil suit that just got chucked out the window so (laughs) i just have all kinds of again i have all kinds of issues with this statement of him doing that had nothing to do with the filmmakers defaming him he already he was already defamed and he knows it i mean otherwise why are you making statements that's right the fact that he's making a statement is demonstrates that clearly if you know if you didn't feel like your integrity quote unquote integrity had been questioned why make a statement and why take it so personal andy well yeah and you know not only this you know, and as we move forward in time after making murder comes out he writes another letter to the to the sheriff and he changes his story <laughs> that's a, another real problem for me and probably for other people as well Fox 11 also spoke with Scott Tuttick, Stephen Avery's brother-in-law. He said, quote, what happened yesterday is the best thing in the world. And also, he got what he got coming to him. Okay, so um, let's, uh, should we give Scott Tuttick the benefit of the doubt here? What happened yesterday is the best thing in the world. He got what he had coming to him. Are we taking him out of context? Is this being drummed up to add drama or is this pretty accurate uh, depiction of scott i think that you know in all fairness scott 
is a hothead. And I think he was described that way. I think we've seen evidence of that in the October 2017 recording between Barb and, and uh, Stephen and then Scott in the background. He was ranting and raving. And uh, there were other reports from the time frame in real time, as Kelly said, um, of other people describing Scott's behavior. So, and there's also this aspect of what we don't know that's happened in the background. So clearly, there's there's something going on here that I think more than what, what we could possibly know in real time in 2007. We know more now, but it's unfair to include that specifically as to what happened then. So that's what I think. There's more to it than what we know. And I do think there was a drama effect as well. I, almost, I I totally agree. I think that we have to be mindful that we don't take this out of context because of the, um, you know, this is reported from a statement from making up uh, the media. The other thing that I just want to touch base on and is exactly what Jay Jax just mentioned is we don't know the dynamics of behind the scenes. And we do know that Scott is temperamental and he has an anger issue. We do see that, and I think we'll explore that more in Making a Murderer 2, especially with that phone call. Um, and and we hear Kathleen say that he left her a very colourful, um, I think he says, did, did he say it to her in a voice message calling her the C word or, he re or she was aware that he made a reference to her being the C? Either way, I know Kathleen brings it up. We have to, I've got to be refreshed on that one. Um the reason why I wanted to say about the background is let's give some um, fairness to Scott. Let's just say he isn't a part of the murder or any conspiracy to frame and he is literally just a bystander. And I've mentioned it before. I think he likes to boister himself up. He wanted to be the martyr. He wanted to be the hero. He wanted to be the helpful man for the, uh, the, the, the police for whatever reason his own motives were. If he didn't do anything and he does and he was just watching this trial unravel maybe he is generally just assuming that Stephen was guilty and this is his thoughts on the matter um that you know Stephen was guilty and he got what's coming to him or i have to consider the fact that we know that you know barb was leaving and spending a lot of time in here at his residence um that they had had a new love affair or a relationship and we know that um we hear it that Stephen wasn't too uh keen on you know barb's parenting at this stage as a as a woman who has you know gone into new relationships throughout my years i don't want to say that barb went out intentionally to cause trouble but sometimes you know she could have been telling him things that you know Stephen was saying and that was making him angry because he might have felt like he was being blamed for Barb's behavior and her parenting for example Stephen could be like you're never fucking home you're always with him blah 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 and then she's gone back venting to Scott and being like oh you know Stephen's blaming our relationship on the boys being acting up blah 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 and that already creates that issue and you feed on that as, you know, the, the family will feed on that. They'll start latching on to those issues. Um, so it's little things like that that I think we have to take into consideration. We all know that the family liked Tom Yanda. So, you know, when she leaves Tom Yanda for what his cousin Scott Tadich, you kind of think that there was already a problem in the family. There was already a bit of blood bad blood and a bit of a bad taste in everyone's mouth so again this doesn't make him guilty for saying that it doesn't mean that he was a part of anything it just means that there might have been more to the story than just this statement at face value uh, i agree and i, I want to add and this is coming from now going back to real time and again i'm just basing this on what barb some of the statements barb has made and, you know, some of the different uh, podcasts that we've had is that basically Scott was under, he didn't really have a choice in what he said in, in some of the statements that he's made, public statements and so forth. Um, 
and we have to separate. You know, we, we do have to separate, and it's really difficult at this point. But to think back in that time frame in 2005, you know, we can start in September, October, November, and move forward. What does Scott really know about the family? What did he know about each individual one? Well, he knows you know, Avery's been in prison for all these years, and he was wrongly convicted. But there's probably, a you know, we all know Stephen was no Boy Scout. He, he had his problems. He did shit that he shouldn't have done. So that probably did tailor it. Plus, on top of that, I'm sure that, you know, uh, he, he and Barb talked throughout the 15, 16 months leading from the time of this all occurred until this time here for after trial, maybe 17 months, whatever it is. So those conversations were probably somewhat tailored and colored. Again, this could have been a, they could, they could have gaslit him up before the statement was made to the media. You never know what a reporter has said to him, right? So we, we have to be careful of that. Oh, absolutely. I think we've, we've, we really need to take that on. The the question that he could have been asked, um, the quotation marks from this, like these statements could have been referenced to something completely different. We, you just don't know. That's why I said you have to take it at face value that what right. the statement is, is in reference to the conviction of Stephen Avery in its whole versus something significant he was asked in question form and this was just an answer back that they've twisted. We should be all... Mm very well aware now the mainstream media like value in drama they like it it sells it creates the last sentence he got when he got coming to him does i mean it rings with the word revenge like just the way it comes across like we're not saying that he's involved in some frame job but he's like you know karma's a bitch kind of thing right oh absolutely and and you don't know like i'm Again, this is speculative and this is just an opinion. Um, I'm not adding any value of weight to this being factual. And again, I'm just putting it out there. But you got to also remember at this stage, there was a lot of Barb going back and forth between blaming Stephen for um, Brendan Dassey as well. You hear phone calls going, you've got me 10000 or how much ever money it was for my son's bail. And he's like, oh, I, don't know. I don't have nothing. And she's like, what the hell's happening, Stephen? He goes, I didn't do nothing. Like, your son was the one that spoke and put himself into this shit. But you can hear that bouncing between her uh, throughout these phone calls in between this time. She believes him, then she doesn't, and then she believes him, and then she doesn't. It's like she gets on the phone to Stephen. He reassures her. She gets off. She then gets flooded with all, like, influence of law enforcement. And That's right. Everyone's in her ear and then she slips again and goes, now, fuck Stephen. And this is what I'm not saying that in any means that Scott was sticking up for Stephen, uh, for Brendan. But this could be him protecting and sticking up for his girlfriend's son in this perspective. He got what's coming to him because maybe he was, again, this is out of context because we don't know what the question actually was. The the question could have been, for example, um, you know, what do you think about Stephen putting Brennan, making Brennan being a part of this? And he's gone, he got what's coming to him. Again, it, it's it's open for speculation and it's open. I mean, it designs, like, it's designed that way to get salacious exactly. quote, quotations. Sure, absolutely. But, to, it, you know, my, my to elicit a response. Exactly. Yep, yep. My thing about Scott was I try to put myself in Scott's shoes and I think, you know, if – Stephen is being judgmental of Barb and their relationship. And if I was Scott, I would tell him where to go with it, to mind your own business. And I would have animosity towards Avery, towards Stephen because he's pointing his nose where it doesn't belong. And whether it like I would be like, your brother said what about us? Like you should tell him to piss off. You know what I mean? Like I for in that oh, sense, absolutely. I, kind of, I kind of feel with Scott because it's like Mind your own business, man. Like, you, well, your life is so good right now. Like, you got to worry about my girlfriend and, and her and, and your sister's life. I, you know, that's how tensions rise so quickly in, in these uh, scenarios. And, uh, you know, obviously I've lived in some different scenarios and seen a lot of things, but tensions rise quickly. Oh, in domestic situations, they can go from zero to 102 seconds. 
There you go. Exactly. And that's what I was trying to say in terms of the family dynamics. It's not that Barb would have been trying to cause a rift in the family between her new partner and Stephen Avery, but when she's being when she's upset because Stephen's just yelled at her, and we got to remember this is around the same time that we know that there was an issue because all the boys and uh, bring up that Mum and Stephen had a fight like on the Wednesday, and and you hear law enforcement asking in the questions what was the fight about and they're like oh oh i don't know and then the next minute you hear um you know the phone calls where it's kind of like they've gotten past whatever it was um and then you hear obviously Stephen talking to jody about you know barb's coming and going again and then there's another phone call where he's pissed with the boys the boy one of the, one or two of the boys are acting up and he, he's over it he doesn't even want to see the boys he's like oh i'm done you know, I'm done with them, basically. Um, I don't want nothing to do with them. So, again, when, when she's upset, she could have been going over to Scott's going, and exactly what you just said, Jeff Jones, Stephen's at me again. He's blaming you. He's blaming me. I'm sick of this shit. He needs to back the fuck out of our relationship. He's been in jail for years. He can't just come in here and take over. And that's And the reason why I say that, is because that's become a really big part of the characterization for Stephen Avery. And it, in fairness, a lot of the family have said that he is controlling. And I don't ever think that he's – if he is controlling, I don't ever think Stephen brings the controlling from a dark place. I think he brings it because he cares. He wants to be – successful and happy and he tries to control and get his life back from all the years that were were taken from him oh, yeah. and he I just mean, wants he... to control what happens to his future and to do that he has to make sure that all the surrounding people are helping him achieve that he can't have people going out doing illegal shit around him so yeah he might come across controlling because he's protecting him protecting because he knows he's a focus of law enforcement. We have to come to the conclusion that Stephen, being in prison for most of his adult life until this point, is very much still in a transition. His head is still probably in prison. It's just his body. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't, three years is not really enough of adjustment. You know, we remember they were saying he was living in an ice shanty for a time. He didn't have permanent residence. He's just kind of transient. And, uh, And so, yeah, I mean... He his sense of what people should be doing because prison says no at six o'clock you have dinner and then at nine o'clock it's lights out and that's how it goes right and so for him to see uh you know his sister taking off at nine o'clock at night when it's lights out you know i mean your brain's just programmed different i think and i think maybe that's the case i don't know for sure but we'd have to kind of assume that steven's understanding of what you're supposed to do in the daytime is very much molded by the last 18 years you know that's that's my take that's a really fair comparison because it's it's that has become his his character that's become who he is and in fairness that's a perfect summary we 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 seem to always forget that you know we have behavior panelists look at Stephen and go he's a psychopath because of some of his mannerisms and it's like you know what you didn't even do the research to know that he has an intellectual disability and on top of that he's is severely institutionalized he's he's lived in a jail for 18 years and he's accustomed to the rules regulations and order of jail life so you know it, it we I think you know the community we we we're very mindful of it, like it's always there, but I don't think, and I don't think we use it as an excuse for Stephen, but I think we need to consider it more with some of his actions because, you know, I think, I, I don't want to get personal, but I do know someone that spent, um, went to jail when he was 19 and then got out at 31 and he literally came out and he wanted to go live in a caravan, a very very small space because he just couldn't adjust to the big outside world and you know he carried on those you know he latched on to those um jail those mannerisms. jail life the mannerisms he he, he latched on to them and he couldn't shake it he and he was so and when he'd eat he'd sit there and he would like he'd eat awkwardly and i'm like are you right he goes 
and he'd like inhale his food. I'm like, why are you inhaling? Like, just slow down. He's like, it's just habit. I, I you have a certain amount of time to eat or you don't eat and then you, you got to carry on. And I'm just like, fucking hell. So I think again, in fairness to Stephen, it's, it's part of his reality. It's part of his world. It's part of his history. And unfortunately it became past, part of his present and future. And he was protecting it. feel good or, or bad but first vote you know a lot of times what jurors do is they go in and they say okay let's just take a see a show of hands where people are leaning right now seven for not guilty the vote was seven innocent three guilty and two undecided that's the way they started off now obviously it didn't, it didn't stay that way The majority of us were easygoing and laid back, but um, a couple stubborn ones too. And um, it seems like stubborn people can sway softer people their way. It's just, I don't know, for some reason, psychologically, I think that's possible. I know there are three that were stubborn and you know, weren't participating, which made me feel uncomfortable being there. I deliberated for four hours with the jury and had to leave because of a medical emergency. And um, I felt there was some biased jurors that didn't, you know, keep an open mind and they had their mind made up, be you know, before the trial started, which I was pretty discouraged about myself. This is Juror Mailer that has been uh, a lot of talk about him recently. Mm -hmm. um, he's done interviews with Mark Hottenot, and I've linked uh, that in the previous video, and I will link to part two in this one. Um, yeah. And so he's been he's been outspoken. In, he's been in the space, let's say that. Maybe not outspoken, but he has been in the space. He's been in the making a murder space pretty much since. And uh, the things that he says uh, you can take for what you believe or what you want to believe, but um, it sounds ab about right, about having these stubborn jurors that we've heard about. Absolutely. And, and I'll give it to him. He stayed very consistent. So he's always maintained the, the 732. He's maintained that, you know, in a part of his um, experience, there was them stubborn ones. They weren't going to budge. It, very consistent. Again, um, what happened after he left, we'll never know. We just don't know. Uh, no one seems to have ever stepped forward. A and I have watched Mark's interview with him. And again, consistency is on point. But there is, unfortunately, a lot of hearsay in terms of he's speaking on behalf of someone else that told him what happened after the fact when he left. No one, again, we have no vetting of that. We have had no one that I'm aware of that has come forward and went, yes, when Richard left, yes, that, that incident with Andy Colburn rocking up at my house because, um, you know, allegedly there was a 911 call. That has never come from the source itself. That's Richard here saying that out. Do I believe it? Yeah, I believe it. But I just wish there was – I just don't understand how everyone's kept so silent over the years and not stepped forward. Is it fear? <laughs> Was it genuine fear of law enforcement that they were going to get targeted themselves? I don't know. I just know that whatever happened, it happened and the state won and law enforcement got what they wanted and what went wrong in that, I don't know. And the thing that I always ask myself when it comes to the jury now is this. Everything, you know, we always go back to what happened inside the courtroom and was there enough experts? Was there not enough experts? Did, and people ask, did Dean and Jerry do enough? Did they not do enough? We now need to not, like, ask ourselves, would it have even mattered? Because if, if he's genuine what he's saying and this is the reality of what was going on in the jury room, I don't think you, you could have had 100 experts and I don't now think it would change the outcome. It was already like it was already going to be what it was before they even went into deliberation. If three 
had already made up their mind. At best, they could have maybe got a hung jury if the other seven didn't turn. But it sounds like it was in the bag for Ken Kratz and the law enforcement. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, yeah, we don't know what was said. You know, we're looking at other juries and, and other uh, cases where it's pretty obvious that fear became a factor for them if they didn't go a certain way. Uh, seeing that the, I think very strongly in the Holtz Claw case because of just uh, the situation going on there, it could have very well been the same thing here. Um, you know, it was good that beating. You know, he did say that, you know, it was 732, that, uh, you know, on a quick vote in the beginning. Um, and I think, uh, uh, Jeff, I believe you asked me, or I think it was you, about who was serving on that jury. And I uh, I had actually asked Mystic Jinx, and because I couldn't remember. I, I was thinking it was one of the other ones, but it was Carl Wardman that had a son that worked for MTSO. He was a juror. We don't know uh, what got said. I suspect part of it was fear. I suspect there was a lot of uh, conversation that was, that happened in there that um, we'll never know. But there is one other thing uh, about a juror from the Avery trial, and I can't tell you this person's name, but I do know that they showed up at the Dassey trial looking for answers. They, they did give that statement. Oh, yes. I'll try to... Yes, I remember this one. Yes. Yeah, which I, I found really, really strange. Um why would you do that? <laughs> you know, so I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever know. I just know that I think that any one of them or probably, probably pretty much all of them could go through a book about their experiences within the, the you know, the, the whole trial and, and the deliberations. But uh, it seemed like they almost made a pact. I'm not going to do anything publicly. It's interesting that he like said that regarding because I completely forgot about the other juror that went and went furthermore and wanted to go watch Brennan Dassey's. That just makes me wonder, again, this is speculative on my behalf. It just, when you said it, it just triggered a thought in me and I'm just vocalising it out. They, it, it makes me wonder whether or not the jurors always knew that at the back of their mind. I know they weren't re- allowed to use Brennan Dassey in part of their deliberations, but to know at the back of their mind that there was going to be another another trial because a, a gentleman, a boy, my apology, a boy had confessed to it, whether that weighed into it as individuals because the fact that they said that they went there to try to find the answers that was lacking in the Stephen Avery trial, were they then satisfied hearing the state's narrative for Brennan Dassey's where they say he confessed and then you get to watch well they played that part of him confessing but then they chopped the bit where he's like they got to my head you know what I mean like so at the back of each juror's mind when it came to deliberation although it was 732 was that maybe where the flip happened with the seven where it was like you know someone cheekily could have went don't forget this is a two-part you know crime here you know and, and and we don't know what got said in there. If you've got a manipulative piece of shit of a juror that's working that's right. on behalf of the state, they could have slipped that in as a reminder. Just just remember, this isn't just about Stephen Avery. You know, we've got a confession in this case, but they're well, just not allowed to use it. That's where my question comes to you guys. You're kind of leading into it. It's like, how heated of a discussion can can it get in a jury, juror room? Like, how very. Like, can you, you know, say, come on, man, you, you're, you're being stupid if you can't see it. Like, can you, how heated can it get? Oh, I think it can get very heated. Uh, I mean, certainly not physical and, you know, can't use physical threats, but using that mental pressure. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, you know, and that's another thing, you know, and leading uh, also talking about what Kelly just mentioned, uh, this whole deal with Brendan, Remember, you guys got to remember that all that didn't get separated. Brendan didn't get really separated out of even them being co-defendants until about a week before Avery's trial. Up until that point, they were considered true co-defendants, really co-defendants. So, 
because you know he, he refused to take any kind of plea or anything. Then that all came up um, in some motion, like five or six, seven days, whatever it was, before, before trial. And they said, "Hey, we need to remove Brendan's name from everything from Stephen's trial." And that's basically what they did. Now Brendan's trial, it wasn't that way because Stephen had been convicted, so they could drag his name all through Brendan's trial. It's just complete fuckery. Convenient. All I know is a lot of us were weak. Starting a deliberation is weak and tired. I don't know if it was a compromise. You know, let's just do something here so we can get out of here. I don't know. To me, there's a lot of unanswered questions. As an opinion of my own, you'd have to be a piss poor fucking human being if you have the, a man's life and future in your hands and you're willing just to give up because you just want to go home because you're tired and you're hungry and you want to go to sleep. Like in all reality, I hope to God, I would rather hear that they fought and fought and fought to the point that the mentality of the issue got so bearing on them that they were like, these three ones won't budge. I just can't do it anymore in terms of I fought the four versus, yeah, I'm just going to give up because I want to go home to bed and eat. You'd have to be a, a fucking low blow person, human being, if you're going to give up on someone's future and life because of that. That that would drive, oh, that just makes me sick to the stomach. So I hope that the seven that did go in that had the 732, I hope they fought and I hope they fought hard. I don't know what the turning point for them seven would have had to have been, but it you'd have to have you would have had to have gotten there somewhere with the belief that Stephen was guilty. Honestly, because if you were to give up on any other reason than his guilt, then no wonder they're not coming forward to speak because they're either living with karma or or they're living with guilt for the rest of their lives. And deep down, they just don't have the ball still to come out and say, oops, I gave up. Well, yeah, some people are that way, Kel. I think, um, I'm, I'm sure they are. And, and you know, they get talked into. Oh, absolutely. Of, but we're, we're talking about a 732, like the 7 uh, I, I know. power. So I that's, know. A, that's a, it's different if it's like, if it was seven guilty, three, um, innocent and too undecided but the, the seven as a as a that, that was a powerful that's a powerful number compared to three and two they held the power so that's what well, i mean what was it you I know what was the in, what was the item that got them that they, that exactly. they finally said okay all right exactly. and i think it's what was one it that we, that we keep talking about and i i think i'd have to re rewind to another podcast kelly but i think you've mentioned it many times and it's the blood in the rev four yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it went back to the evidence, like in terms of the forensic evidence, because I don't think the jury probably would have understood the planting. Explain that. Yeah, explain that. So explain I think that so blood in the RAV4. And yeah. now you and I and Jack and those people in the chat all come are coming at this from a different point. And and we can, in hindsight, it's 2020, but, you know, we still struggle with, how does their blood get in the RAV4? And we, we do experiments and we go through this, right, over and over again. And what are the possibilities? So to me, if if I had to guess, that would be it. Well, add to that, again, Carl Wardman's son worked for MTSO as a cop. So he's in there and saying, look, guys, you know, my okay, kid works not, there. Yeah. yeah, these guys are not crooked. Come on, what are you talking about? Are you fucking crazy? Come on. Now look at the evidence. Look at what we've got here, and and it could have been that that could have just brought some people across the line. Every guilt, every guilty person blames the cops. They all do that. Come on, you're not really falling for that, are you? Exactly. Absolutely. That's right. Exactly, and that's what my point is, though. Because if that's the case, then I can see the seven turning not because of pressure, but because they were eventually convinced that of his guilt versus just doing it because they had no other choice. God, I want to hope that. I, I really do. I'm like so you. I, I want to, I, I want oh, to think that, God. you know, they, they really thought this guy was set up and they fought to say, okay, prove it, prove that these guys didn't set him up because of the lawsuit. You're going to have to show me something 
to convince me to go the other way. I hope so. Well, we'll never really know, but you know, the the jurors, if you're listening, you know, go on the record. Uh, a lot of people he's, would be satisfied with you doing that. So, in fact, this is an invite. I think if there's anyone that's ever served on a jury duty, it would be awesome to talk to you guys because. <clears throat> I would like to get a fresh perspective of someone that has done a deliberation and just the the mindset of, like I said in uh, the last podcast, you know, we don't, we think logically as humans, we don't have, like, we don't automatically go, oh, that's hearsay, or we don't use legal terminology to make rulings. When we hear something, we use our, our senses and our instinct and our common sense to kind of form an opinion and a baseline of the situation and I think that is what you know when I listen to um, there's some really great law um, lawyers out there that are on YouTube that are in the community that they kind of go over cases and they give you like a 101 law degree for dummies basically they walk you through what everything means and a lot of them who are defence, they're, they're the ones I like to watch is the defence lawyers because, you know, they really break down the, the the job of what they have to do and how hard it is when you've got the prosecution up against you and, you know, you're fighting for someone's innocence and it's, you know, <clears throat> you're in a situation where you even know that it's probably lost but you, you fight, you fight to the end because everyone, you hear them say everyone has a legal right to good representation. Um and the thing that I really found valuable in hearing them is when they all they all say when they finish a trial, they all try to find like a jury, like one of the jurors, and they will go up to them and they'll say to them, and apology if I've already said this in a podcast, but I just like to echo it because I think it's really important to understand this. But they go up and they say to them, what made what like what made you go against me or for me like if they lost the case they'll say what where did I go wrong was it me was I not representing the client enough was the client the problem itself what was it that made you say he was guilty and vice versa they'll say to them what part of the trial when I was deliberate like delivering you my defense did you go nail drop he's innocent and Every single one of them, every single one of them always say the irony of it is what they think that they've done good at in terms of the trial where they think, oh, we've just driven that home. We've got the best expert. We've got the best forensic science on this one. We've got proof. We've, I'm going to use the word debunked. Like we have debunked this as a prosecution's um, narrative, rah, rah, rah. And then he go, and then they all go, but the crazy part is, when we ask the jury, it's 99% of the time, it isn't even that part. It's something so significant that I spent five minutes on that I didn't even think, you know, it was it was important to bring up, but it wasn't important enough to, you know, deliver more. And it was that part that they latched onto. And so what I'm trying to say in terms of jury is we, we're allowed to speculate what could have happened in the 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 jury room in terms of making a murderer and Stephen Avery's case because no one knows. So we're either all wrong or we're all either right. Like it, it's fair game. We're allowed to have diversity conversation about this of what could have happened. If we all thought the same, then it'd be an echo chamber of I mean, sheep. basically that's what we are a lot of times is we are in our own jury room. Mm, exactly. And I've heard this before. And that's why there's these differing opinions and you're trying to sway people. But, you know, if your argument's good enough, you shouldn't have to convince anybody, right? <laughs> that's what I always yeah. think. The argument should so stand on its own. Yeah. And I think that's what this is what this case is about. It's <clears throat> what changed for the jury. Because at the end of the day, the case put on, the, the prosecution and the defense put on their strongest case. They delivered it as best and as strong or as weak as they could. But at the end of the day, it came down to 12 individuals. What was the swinging factor? Because at the end of the day, if it was something that couldn't have been swayed, then there's nothing that this outcome would have changed, in my opinion. You would have had the same outcome no matter what. There's one more aspect that we're forgetting, and I don't know how big of a event it was, and that's when the jury 
when they retired for the day, you know, they were sequestered. They asked if they could have adult drinks. They made the call to the bailiff, the, the jury bailiff. The judge said, yeah. Hegel says, hey, I'll take that message to them. Don't worry about calling them. And he goes and has drinks with the jury. And I have a real problem with that. I have a real problem with it uh, as a law enforcement officer. I mean, I think we could, you know, ask uh, Sapper Cop. He could probably talk for several minutes uh, in, a, in the negative about the sheriff going and having any interaction with the jury in under any conditions when they're sequestered, actually in any capacity during trial. That's from beginning to end. That should have been passed on to the jury bailiff and said to tell the jury, yeah, you guys go ahead and have a you know a couple of drinks, whatever, with your dinner. It's fine. That didn't happen. So we don't know what was that. Again, this is speculation warning, guys. I don't mean to leave any innuendo out there. It could have just been drinks. They were having dinner in the story. But why would he do that? That's just to leave, it, leave that hang. Go ahead. Wasn't, wasn't there a pizza story as well? Someone did Brendan, pizza? Brendan, Was that Brendan's, Brendan? Brendan's trial. So we've got pizza in Brendan's trial. And we've got drinks in Stephen Avery's trial, both to do with the jury. Yes, right. With the pizza? That is fucked up. It is. Was it who was what? with the pizza? Who had the pizza? Because they got reprimanded, didn't they? Uh, it was Remaker that got reprimanded. I think over that. Uh, God, now you're dredging up ancient history. I can't remember. I'll have to read up before we get too deep into that. I'll try to find out on the pizza story. Yeah, yeah, the pizza story is. Uh... Who knows? It could be pivotal, right? Everybody loves pizza. You know, that's the point I was going to make. You're not going to you're not going to do something against the guy who brings you alcohol, and you're not going to hold a grudge against someone who brings you pizza. You know, they're just trying to butter these guys up, and you know what I mean. We're good people. We we deliver pizza and and alcohol, right? Yep. <laughs> it seems like to me they're just trying to butter him up. I just, I just don't understand how, in uh, Sheriff uh, Pegel's mind, that he could justify going and interacting with a sequestered jury. I, I just don't. But yeah, tell me under what, like, in under what crazy movie that happens in. I've never seen that like, happen. Think about that. Ever. Give me a scenario under where you'd be like, and then the sheriff went in and brought him drinks. Never seen that happen. Ever. What? Not even in a cowboy movie, I've ever seen something so crazy. And yet, it's and it, it no, no one, nothing ever happens. This is what I'm saying. They break the rules. They break the policy. Nothing happens. I have a question, and this is uh, for either of you. Um, it's more to refresh my memory. Do we know on the like what time or day? Because we're talking about the jury. Um, they requested to see Bobby Dassey's uh, testimony again because we, I know that they asked uh, to, to see it or have it read back to them, but it was declined. Um, do we know where that fit in in terms of what day it was that this was requested? I don't think we know that for with any authority at all. I just don't think we know that, Kel. Okay, because, you know, like, again, this is very speculative, but it's a conversation to have, and it's I'm going to play the two parts of it um, on terms of what's out there in, in the community in regards to the thought process of why the jury asked for it, because obviously it's been a topic of conversation over the years. Uh, there's one side of the fence that believe they asked for the – the testimony again because they frankly didn't believe Bobby Dassey and they thought there was something really wrong with him and they they could see that he might have been the Bobby did it person. I don't know. But that, that's a fair assumption that in the community there's people that have considered that that's the motive of asking for the, the testimony, the transcription of his words. And then – and, and I kind of sat there for – I've sat there. Like, I've considered that, like, um, they maybe didn't believe him. And he is – although I don't think he is the case, I think that he played a good part in the case in terms of bringing the timeline together. 
But then on the other side of the fence where I've been going lately, and I think this is where it rests and why I asked the question of where it sat in terms of the deliberations is I'm wondering if that was part of the turning point for the jurors because what if we always look at it as like the half, the glass is half full, what if the glass is half like empty and we look at the other side of that, what if that they were looking for what he said because they had considered him guilty they had all made a decision that Stephen was guilty and asking for Bobby's testimony to be read back to them again was placing for them especially the seven the timeline of events together again the the three um gen- the three jurors that were like he's guilty he's guilty he's guilty could have went back to that and said again his nephew saw him last with her. The last person that was last seen in her presence was Stephen Avery. And maybe that's what they wanted to see the Bobby T- Dassey testimony to, f- to kind of put all those pieces together in their own heads and go, right. we don't know. We are satisfied that, that yeah. he was the last one to see it. So that's what I think we have to do in this case is we have to look at all the alternatives that we all just sat with oh no they all wanted it because they thought he was uh, Bobby was lying oh, because Bobby was suspicious no oh, it could Bobby have been was suspicious. No. The, the timeline right exactly yeah, so that was the establishment like, of know, the timeline we, say, we, get, we get stuck on these these points of reference or these things and we take them and we run with it and we don't know if we always confirmed it so again we're finding another example of where we have to we have to, you know, what do we actually know, right? And and that's the struggle. Exactly. So I think it's a great point that you made there. And it is because um, it's we're, we're we're discussing making a murder of the documentary. This is what we're doing, and we're we're adding we're trying to add things that we know now, and we're trying to you know talk about the things that might have been projected add context, a little bit right. and context. And and I think this is one of those contexts. We all watch making a murderer, and if you no one walked away after watching Make Him Murder and went, there's something wrong with Ryan Hillegas and maybe Bobby Dassey would make a great Denny, then you weren't paying attention to the documentary. Absolutely. I don't, know, I don't know anyone that didn't walk away with those two thoughts. And and then you have to wonder, is that because that's the narrative of Make Him Murder? They want you to question these things or was it edited the way that they needed you to see these things or was it just – they were showing us a reality. They captured a reality and that's how our instincts were latching on to what we were seeing. Again, I just wanted to bring that up because it's it's part of what we're doing here. We're breaking down making a murderer. We're adding and addressing the context. So I just wanted to bring that up. An apology because I know a lot of people get real antsy about this in terms of me being, um, you know, I don't mean to be defensive and, and – like sit there and go no to this and no to that but you you got to you have to consider everything you can't take a documentary and and just run with it and and I'm not saying that people do because I know there's a lot of people that go beyond that a majority of us that's why we're here is we've read the case files and we've looked at all DCI reports and we've listened to audios and we've done excessive amount of research but at the end of the day we are all no closer to the truth because we all don't have the truth because things are limited to us. It's just our own, um, I guess, interpretation. And, and I think that that's why I just want to address things. So, yeah. Absolutely. It, it, it's perspective. And that brings up a, a really good point of what were they, you know, perspective again, that this is a subjective thing. It's not always objective. And in fact, a lot of times it's not objective at all. It's completely subjective. So, you know, when they had this finished product, I'll be as brief as I can here. When they had this finished product that they wanted to release, from their perspective, I'm talking about the filmmakers, probably even a lot of people uh, around them. What was the perspective that they had that they were trying to impart to what they were releasing to the public? And that's key. And this, what you guys have talked about, us latching onto certain things that really grab us that are completely fucking wrong. We found out they're wrong because the perspective of what they're showing is not the reality of what really happened. So it's, it's really important that we do. We have to understand that. 
As for Bobby, I, I will try to find out if I can from what information we do have. If we can, if I can drive down a time frame as to when the jury did ask uh, Cal, I don't think we have it. I don't think it's included in the transcript. Um, I, I do know that the documentation of Judge Wills talking about it is there, but I don't think it gives an actual time. We may give. I might be able to drive it down to which day. I'll try to find out. To me, there's a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, to me, I believe we don't know for sure. I mean, I don't know for sure who killed Teresa or how it happened. I mean, all I have is statements from both sides. But I don't think anybody will ever know what actually happened. I just wanted to give him a little bit of a, you know, prompts for that because I liked how he didn't just offer an opinion and a speculative one. He was just honest, like, I don't think we'll ever know. And, and I think that gives him a little bit more credibility because he's he wasn't he was given an opportunity to push a narrative that he wanted, but he didn't. He was like, you know what, I just don't know. So he That's wasn't right. just saying something just to put a filler in there to match where we're going with this narrative of Stephen Avery's innocence. He's just being honest. That is hats off to him for taking that opportunity and being real and being honest. I agree. 100%. Yeah, exactly. Like leave that to us, leave the speculation to the podcasts and to the people who consume media. And, you know, I think that was absolutely the right thing. Mr. Kratz is an experienced prosecutor. Mr. Kratz knows right from wrong. Mr. Kratz knows ethics. Mr. Kratz acted unprofessionally in this. I can't respect him for it. He's supposed to be seeking the truth. <clears throat> This wasn't seeking the truth. He was seeking a conviction. And as a district attorney, he is responsible above everybody on this. He called the shots. He told the cops which way he wanted them to run. And he is probably the most culpable of anybody for this. And they gave him an award for winning this case. It's... What's going on? Anybody want to unpack a little bit about Ken Kratz and those comments right there? Yeah, because you, you know, uh, he, but you know, he, he, he did a lot that really wasn't put forth in the documentary documents that we've got uh, about Stephen being recorded in the jail. That didn't make it into the documentary. I, I don't know if they didn't know the filmmakers themselves. Uh, or they just chose not to put it in there because these documents were readily available. There's one in particular. He wrote a memo to uh, Beauty and String and told him this was in July of 2006 and told them it was a conversation that he had with the jailer at the time. So I, I, I don't know what happened, but I think that, you know, th there's not supposed to be any recording devices in the privacy rooms at all but there was we clearly know that how i just don't understand the mindset of, of how that this is okay and under any circumstances that because if there's a recording that's not monitoring when you monitor something you're just looking at them somebody's watching they're monitoring that that uh that uh screen at all times when somebody's in that room if something happens they engage immediately on top of that there are always guards I think that in that particular room, there was two doors. It was glass. And there were guards posted on, on both sides of those doors. So they would have known immediately if something was going to happen or if something was happening with a prisoner attacking their lawyer or, or their clergy or whatever. So this whole thing, he just said, King Kratz is ultimately culpable in this. 
I think well, we can go more. We we'll go more into that later. I'm, I'm not going to dive off too far into the King Kratz problem, but I think Pete pretty much outlined that perfectly. Everybody for this, and they gave him an award for winning this case. It's, um... What's going on now just proves, in my opinion, proves that how hell bent they were on nailing him you know how dare an avery make county look bad you know now it's turned back around again the county's making avery look bad and i think that's right where they wanted it to be you know it played right out in their hand If it's all right with you guys, I'd like to have a talk about Brendan. Um, sort of a heart to heart on this. Um, I don't know where your family is on this, but as horrible as this is for a 44 year old man, it's 10 times worse when you're talking about a 17 year old boy who's uh, not very bright and um, you know, hasn't had a chance in life. Um, now, I, will, I know we lost the trial, but I think now this community is a lot less certain that Stephen and Brendan did it than they were before we started Stephen's case. Yeah, because we're getting more letters that he's innocent, 100% innocent, oh, she says. That has to help Brendan. And when the, when the prosecutor stands up in closing argument, you guys, and says all the evidence shows that one man and one man only is responsible for the death of Teresa Halbach. One. <laughs> one. Yeah, one. One and one only. Yeah. Meaning yeah. Stephen Avery. Yeah. So how do you come in and prosecute yeah. a, a 17 year old yeah. boy after you've stood up and said that? That Mark and Tom, that Tom called up uh, Scotty the other day. Scotty was supposed to get Barbara to uh, tell Brendan to take the plea bargain. Mm -hmm. No, that would be a no no. That's 15. <laughs> That's what, Ash wants Did she tell deal. you that too? Plea is 15 years and then 15 probation. Uh -huh. So, I mean, seriously, Tom called Scott Toddick mm -hmm. and said, Tell your wife to make her. That's son what she told me. Take you, you, you know, I, I know Kelly's got something to say. I'm going to say hey. this briefly. Well, I, I've tried, you know, over the course of the you know, six and a half years of time to draw the emotion back. But I can tell you, when it comes to Brendan, I still get really pissed off and I get really emotional. I, I cannot stop. I have children his age and I, I cannot prevent that. I apologize. Go ahead. I don't apologize. Uh, we're all there with you. Um mine was more on my comment was more on the basis of hindsight what we know now it's just so painful to hear dean bring that confidence forward you know i know dr silkman would be smashing his ipad at this stage because he, you know it's such a topic that we always go back to is ken kratz one man one man did this and now he's about to try to prosecute a 16 year old uh, boy but at the end of the day, the sad reality is the community didn't make a difference because Brendan Dassey was actually found guilty of his charges quicker than Stephen Avery's was in terms of deliberation with the jury. It was a all of the charges. All, all of the charges. All, all of the, of the charges. Ch exactly. So it just goes to show that the community can be powerful in terms of. Um, the wider community but when it comes to the the judgment of the law we get where it's deaf ears they don't give a shit it's the power in those walls that make the, the difference not us on the outside screaming and i think we learn that more and more every day when uh tone is it governor evers is just ignoring the fact that he has the power to fix a very bad wrong 
and he just doesn't want to touch it with the bar of soap, whether that's because of politics, and I'm not going to get into that because that's like talking about war and and religion. It's something that I don't go down those roads, but it, it's it's just insane. And what a what a very sad moment to watch um, Ma Avery have to go through this, knowing her fate, not ever seeing her boys release. Dean's desperation and of of hope, because that's what he's kind of delivering them here is hope, and to know what we know now, hope was gone. In in fairness, Brendan, I don't think he had a chance, and and it proved he didn't. I agree with you, Kel, and you know, it, you know, without getting into the ins and outs of. The political arena, it is political. It's, it's highly political because, you know, we have to, we've talked about it before. This goes back to the 85 case, which pushes forward to 2005 with the depositions, which then brings in the Gregory Allen Cole case that they kept their arms around so tight. No one heard about it. I put out actually, I actually need to email a couple more of the reporters that were there. As far as I can find out, no one knew anything about Gregory Allen. And if that had blown up in 2005 during the depositions, I promise you what what transpired, uh, what ultimately ended up happening, would not have happened the way it did. It couldn't have. There's no way. Because all that uh, would have rolled right up to K- Kasurik and Vogel's door. <laughs> it just, it's crazy. But, you know, to, um, you know, Dean and Jerry, they did... Uh, there's probably some, and I, I could, because I'm forgetting, uh, you know, some of what happened in making a murder. But you know, they had an expert lined up for um, Brendan uh, for Fremgen and Edelston to use, and they didn't. They paid for it. This guy was paid for, ready to go. There's also um, there was a, a a deposition given by one of the. Uh, um, this guy that uh, they, they didn't allow or testimony given. Yeah, it was in the hearings later on in 2010. They got struck down. That's, that's different. Another again, I'm getting I'm getting too far ahead. But um, yeah, man, I, I tell you this. Watching Dean uh, talk about this and Ma Avery, it, it's it's just it just it just makes my blood boil. It just does. Because I'll add this one final thing. Brendan was involved. Why wasn't he arrested, you know, within the first 30 days of all this shit going down? Why five months later? What? Where, where, where did this bicycle road tr- a path lead? And if you follow it, uh, ultimately, this is me, my opinion, and it's, you know, even somewhat speculatory, but I think it's true. Kratz knew he had to destroy Brendan. He knew that because Brendan was the alibi witness. There's no way he could have allowed Brendan to get on the stand or Avery Strong and say, hey, I was over there. We cleaned up. We, we did this. I cleaned the garage. It was done. He couldn't allow that shit to happen. And what is Scott? Is Scott doing that kind of thing? He's never seemed to me to be on Brendan's side. Oh, and he, t- he told Barbara. And Barbara said there's no way. Lead prosecutor Ken Kratz knows his job is only half done. Avery's co-defendant and nephew, Brendan Dassey, goes to trial on April 16th in Manitowoc County. That trial expected to last yes. two weeks. I know we have to get this going, but I, I think we need to address that real quickly. Like, thoughts on that, that they called Scott Tadich to ask Barb to take a plea. I know this has been a discussion in the community for a while. It is speculative in terms of what motive it was, why, um, what part of significance did Scott play for them to do that? Thoughts? I think that they somehow deep down, they were saying wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're pretty sure they're going to get a conviction. This is the best chance that your son has. I, 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 that's what I think. I think that it, maybe that's a that's a weird way to look at it, and it's not a popular way, but it, it, it is possible that they were – that they knew. they You know, they knew the fix was in maybe, and they were like, he's going to go down unless he takes the plea. Tell him, you know, let's reach out to Scott. I, 
that's just speculation. That's I mean, maybe that's the shiny, the, the sun is shining, perfect uh, explanation for that, doing that. But it sounds nefarious. Something's up. You know, that's not normal. Well, that, that's that's definitely a possibility. Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, the, the other part of this, uh, there are, you know, and, and this is, um, to me, this is a lot of squarely on Michael Kelly interfering in things that he really had no business, in my opinion, interfering with. Uh, the, uh, if you read their emails and their conversations between Kaczynski, and I'm, again, I'm pulling stuff from 2010, but it's relevant to what happened at the time, um, as far as we can find out, and then other documentation but there were communication, you know, between Neil Kelly and, and Kaczynski, and their goal was to find dirt, as much dirt as they could on Avery, feed it to the cops to try to help Brennan in some capacity, which to me, I, I don't agree with what they were doing at all. You know, Kaczynski going so far as to emailing uh, Fassbender and Uyghur and saying, hey, you know, you, you might want to get a warrant to search this, but leave my name out of it. By the way, I don't associate me with it. This is a lawyer for the defense helping the police. It's compl- it's, it's just totally mind blowing to me that they colluded to that degree. Um, but I know that O'Kelly, you know, he he went around and he did a lot of different things. But I do know that he had a he drove from Appleton to Mantwalk one day to have uh, lunch alone with Scott Taddick. What did they discuss? I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd have to say I'm in the middle of the pair of you. I think it was done um, strategically and I think that it was done um, also on the value that they kind of knew that they had it in the bag. They wanted it to be a quick, clean s- sweep in terms of if we can just get him to basically uh, take a plea deal then we can end it and that for them I think it would kind of how would you say by face value kind of show that he's not guilty but taking a plea deal is known in like the community or in law as you're kind of guilty you know you're going to lose and you're just trying to get the easiest time I also think that they kind of reached out to Scott because Barb was very, very vocal on how much she wanted them all to go fuck themselves continuously. So I think they saw that uh, window of opportunity to kind of take advantage of that and they thought she would listen to Scott. And I think they also learnt that Scott was able to be played ball with. He was he was able to change a fire from three metres to ten metres high, uh, taller than a shed. So they knew that he was easily, I don't know whether to say the word manipulated or whether he Influ- was able Influenced. To influ- influence is a very good word to use. So I think they use all these factors to kind of end it in their favour. And at the end of the day, they never gave a fuck about how it would affect Brendan. They just wanted it a win for them and they wanted it to end on their terms in their control. That's just so I'm in the middle of exactly where both of you are. But I thought you we know, better address it. Yeah, it, it's actually worse for, for Scott because his first statement, he didn't mention the fire at all. The November 10th statement, there is no mention of a fire exactly. at all. Yeah. And so. then it kind of evolves, it evolves to this raging ball of destruction so again i just i just thought we should touch base on that because it is big part of the community because we we talk about it all the time like why go to scott like and that's where that's where it spouted off some conspiracy theories with scott being a part of working with the cops and this big cover-up of stephen avery that has that has stemmed from this moment as well so we we don't know how much influence we don't know how much influence really went on behind the scenes with, you know, uh, Uyghur, Fassbender, you know, even other police officers. And then you throw in the scuzzball O'Kelly on top of it. Um, we, we just don't know what kind of pressure they put under him or what they threatened him with. We just don't know. Job is only half done. Avery's co-defendant and nephew, Brendan Dassey, goes to trial on April 16th in Manitowoc County. That trial expected to last two weeks.
Who's our buddy? Our best friend. Toby. Why is he everywhere? I'm that sorry. is the question. This giant <laughs> question. It's a huge question. And then maybe it's a rhetorical question just to keep in our heads as we move forward. But he's everywhere. He is. He's got his fingers just all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So victory for you uh, with the change of venue of bringing the jury in from another county? I, wouldn't, I don't know if you want to call it a victory, but I think it's important that the jury be a fair jury. And I think this is a way to ensure that. When's the last time you talked to Brendan? Uh, we just did. Uh, no, I, we, I met with him actually twice in the last you know, seven days. How's he doing? What's his? He's fine. Yeah. Do you have any He's a very quiet person. Do you anticipate um, discussing with the state the possibility of a plea agreement? Because that has been something prior counsel, I guess, had discussed. Plea negotiation? Correct. Uh, they'll be offered, I'm sure, but once again, we're dealing with preparing for April 16th for trial, and that's the way we're going to continue to prepare. When we actually got copies of the motions and the file from the prosecutor, we realized that there had been some, some major missteps. And so we were not only going to be representing somebody, but we're also now having to go back and try to correct mistakes that are already made. And that's, that makes it a little more difficult because you don't usually get more than one crack at it. And now we're kind of thrown in there to try to fix a problem along with trying to represent somebody. Mark asked me, you know, would I be interested in helping? And uh, after he persuaded me a little bit, I said, sure. <laughs> I think Ray was being nice by saying I asked him. I, I, I pled with him to to help me on this case, because it certainly isn't the case that you can just have one person. And there's not a lot of attorneys in Ashcash that have uh, a background dealing with homicides. And this will be my fifth or sixth homicide case, um, second trial, homicide trial. For those that have read, um, you know, Brendan's trial transcript, um, you know, th these guys got trounced pretty pretty bad in the public and uh, people in the community and you know in, in most cases rightfully so because of missed opportunities and you know that uh, th this phone call or the video uh, where you know they got into my head got clipped they, they apparently didn't get to see that but I gotta say people really should reread the trial testimony because uh, Fremden to some degree, but Edelston, I'm telling you, the guy brought up some really excellent things in the trial that were uh, very inventive. They they were very helpful. Of course, they didn't you know they didn't sway the jury enough, but they they he, he did fight really hard for uh, in uh, at least a, a few different areas for Brendan. Uh, I really thought he did an excellent job in some areas. Obviously, they failed. Miserably and others. I just wanted to bring that up, though. At least they believe in them. That's the main thing. And I believe in them. Everybody, the truth when you got to get up on the stand 
Yeah, but look at all the stuff that they can use, though. What's that? Statements. What did you tell me? How did you get your statement? Well, they talk, They kept on asking me the questions in there. Okay, then. Until they heard what they wanted. That's what you need to tell when you get up on the stand. That's what you need to tell them. The truth. Uh, I guess my question for that part was, this is a little bit of the documentary weaving in some phone calls that happened a little bit pr more previous, or was this, do you think that this that phone call was uh, like the day leading up to this? We don't because the, the, the phone calls that we got, um, the jail calls for Brendan are all undated, all of them. Weird. And I, I raised immortal hell with Calumet County. Amanda, I, I got into a months-long argument with Brent, with uh, Weigert and Amanda over them. But she she took these calls. Somebody did, and ripped them and just saved. Did they just saved them new? So that wiped away all the metadata. It's and it's like, you know, I, when, again, one of these things, uh, they can do what they want, and there's no recourse. I mean, short of hiring a lawyer, so. Can't do that. That's right. Can't. So, well, brings us to the end of the episode and uh, puts us in the closing comments. And I, you know, I might have, you know, some sort of a twitch or something because I don't know how to proceed without Big Jeff. So I guess, you know, Kelly does have the seniority here as the as, as the panelist. So. Maybe we'll let Kelly lead off with the with the wrap up comments, and you know maybe you could just do it do it I, in the. I was going to say, I, I was going to say let let Kel wrap it up because you know she is the most senior, and uh, yeah, go for it, Kel. I will. I will help. We'll help if we need to. But oh, go thanks. for it. <laughs> I feel like I'm in like slipping into big shoes here. But anyway, um, overall, another powerful uh, episode, especially the summary, the last bits we've seen, a lot to digest, a lot that we covered. Um, I just wanted to touch base on the last thing we heard, and that was Barb say, just told the truth. And the irony part about that is he did and he tried. But Mike O'Kelly wouldn't accept it. And that is absolutely fucked up. Like it is beyond anything in this entire case when you have him sit there and write his version of his truth, which was the truth, and then have a man who's meant to be helping you tell you you're wrong. What's wrong with this? What's missing from this? Add Add, add, add. And I've, and I've echoed, echoed this through the community so many times. You, don't, you shouldn't have to change things to make things truthful. The truth is the truth and, it, and you don't have to stretch it. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to mold it. It is just what it is. And when you have Brennan sitting there telling the truth and no one in his own team believed him, where's the justice? There is none. Both these gentlemen are innocent. Both these gentlemen had the entire prosecution and the state against them. Ultimately, they lost. Let's hope their future brings freedom and justice that they finally deserve. Jay Jax. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we're, you know, basing a lot of, of hope on uh, this next step whatever the next step uh kathleen's going to take with this new motion that she's that's you know all is pin, uh, pending um no idea which direction this is going to go i, I could guess a hundred different ways and i probably would guess wrong uh hopefully whatever it is it's a grand slam undeniable that's going to force the state to step up and say okay and and stop the you know, the lies and, and the trickery and, you know, um, whatever else that they can throw at her because they've linked arms up to this point. All of them have. And as uh, Kel 
correctly pointed out, uh, the uh, Stephen and Brendan had the entire mechanism of the Wisconsin uh, uh, legal authority and, and law enforcement against them. D dozens of lawyers, hundreds of, of officers, and I'm not going to say they were all against them, but they all played a part. So I agree. They're both innocent, and I, I hope that whatever um, Kathleen brings forward next uh, will make the difference. Absolutely. I mean, she's she's definitely going to take a swing here pretty soon. I think we're going to be uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about when that happens. But for this week, you know, we've only got so much time each week, and that brings us to the end of this show. So to everybody out there. Uh, in the comment section, thank you to everybody in the live chat now. Thank you. You know, make sure you like and subscribe and share it on your social media. It's, a, it's the easiest way to and the most effective way to support the channel to get to to spread the word if you like what we do. Um, again, thanks, Jack, for coming and filling in for for Dr. Silkman, and we hope that also Dr. Silkman and Big Jeff will be back with us really soon. Um, until then, this is Jeff Jones. This has been Discussing a Murder. Bye, everyone.